So welcome to Living Hope Church of God online and in person. Uh, we just want to thank you for taking part uh, in our service today, for tuning in with us as we are going to be continuing our series on waiting. And so last week, Pastor Mona explained, you know, just what it was to, to wait upon God, that it's not a passive thing, that it is, it is an active thing to wait upon God. And also, uh, she also talked about the nevers and the mindsets that we can have if uh, we are stuck in that time of waiting and we can have those negative thought patterns. And today's topic is really about directing our focus on God. And so I wanted, I'm a, of course, a teacher in me, just likes to use visuals and just to make it sometimes a little clearer to understand. So I would just want to, if you look at the next image, what you see here is you just see small gray shapes, nothing out of the ordinary, uh, little diamond shapes, they have lines, nothing that, that is impressive. If we look at the second picture, there's a focal point. And if you look at the focal point on this picture, for those who are on this side, I don't know if you can see, but if you look at the focal point and you move your head forwards and backwards, everything seems to move on the outside. And so you can see that if you look at the first picture again, you know, nothing seems to move. Nothing seems to be, you know, in movement. It seems actually quite stagnant, gray and dull. And in our seasons of waiting, we can feel at times that nothing is moving. We've been praying, asking God for help. And, and especially, have you ever been in that situation where you're just in limbo? You're waiting for either an answer or for something to change. Whether it's waiting for an answer for a job or you're waiting, transitioning from one place of your life to the next. Waiting for the ability of having a child. If you're single, you're waiting for that moment where you're going to find, the, the, you know, in your head, the perfect spouse. So there's times in our seasons where sometimes being in that place of limbo can make us cause it can cause us to feel like there is intense pressure, a sense of urgency. When you see bills piling up and you still have no income coming in, or you see a deadline coming close and you still don't have what it takes to meet that need. And so there's times of waiting where our, that pressure can seem so uncomfortable. And waiting is uncomfortable, and sometimes it can be even painful to wait. If we're waiting for an answer for a medical condition that we've been suffering, for, suffering with for a long time, sometimes that waiting period can become unbearable. If you have been waiting for just, you've been waiting for so many sleepless nights to find rest, that also can be unbearable. And it's our natural human response to turn our attention towards what hurts us and to look for what can relieve us of that discomfort. And all of our attention and focus can turn towards that one shape in the circle of our life. And then we lose focus of the rest. But when Jesus is the focus, it puts everything into perspective and we get to see the bigger picture. And so Dr. Stanley says that, you know, we tend to focus on the object of our desire, of our waiting, rather than the provider. And sometimes our focus is on that one little square, that one little diamond in the whole circle. And we lose sight of everything else, but also we lose sight of people very often in the midst of all of that. When we become fixated on the, on what we're, our goal is or whether it's you know our need in that moment, we lose sight of people, but we lose sight of God as well. And we lose sight of our relationship with God. Sometimes we're so focused on asking God to meet the need of that one little square that we lose sight of our relationship with Him. And that, you know, and also seeing that He meets that need. And so it doesn't really matter who and what subject, uh, what is the subject of your petition. The one actually that you're actually longing for, the one thing that will bring satisfaction to your heart, peace to your heart, is not always just the resolve to that one issue because there will be many issues in life. It is Christ that is enough. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need or for I have learnt to be content in what 
whatever circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. See, Paul says, I know what my externals can look like. I've learned to live with with good externals and bad externals. But I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in plenty or in want. And often we, we use this scripture, but sometimes we use it out of context. But the full context of this is, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And what he's talking about is finding contentment and peace. He's saying, I can make it through in the difficult times, in those times where I'm waiting. And Paul knew what that was because he spent many years in prison. And let's just say prisons weren't as cushy as as they are today, even though they're not pleasant places, I'm sure, today. Still, they were, I'm sure, a lot even less pleasant. But he learned the secret of what it was to be content even when he was hungry. To be content when he was shipwrecked. To be content when, and to know what it was to have peace and, his, and God's joy in the midst of pain and suffering. Because he knew that the secret was Jesus. And I love, you know, I, I have a short attention span, you know, as part of the millennial generation. And I love that uh, on Instagram, the Daily Bread, they're like, you know what, the young generation, they're not doing well with reading. So let's make little videos for them. <laughs> and there's this little video uh, this week about Psalm 23. And, you know, what we don't realize is that Psalm 23 is actually a wilderness psalm. And you're like, that doesn't make kind of sense because it says, you know, green pastures, that God provides all our needs. But it's actually, David is using it as an example uh, in the context is the wilderness. And so if you look at, at the Judean wilderness, it looks like a place that lacks everything. So if you look at this desert, it looks like there's nothing that the sheep would need in this place. And so David is taking the perspective of his sheep and sheep and goats, and what they need is not naturally occurring in the de- in the Judean desert. Sorry, the Judean desert. I'm struggling with that word. <laughs> the livestock are not lacking anything, though, because their eyes are not on what is missing, but on what they have. The good shepherd. And when the Lord is the shepherd, his people lack nothing. And if we look at what we don't have, if, we, if you go back to that picture of the desert, if we look at, the, at everything that we are seeing, because sometimes when we're in that season of waiting and we're suffering and we're just looking at what hurts us and what we're trying to find relief, all we can see is what we don't have. All we can see is what's hurting us. All we can see is our lack. But let me tell you that when you look to the shepherd, you will find everything that you need. And so if we accept David's invitation to look to the shepherd, then we can join him in saying, when the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And so the place that seems to lack everything, it really actually lacks nothing. The season of waiting can be a season that seems to be lacking everything we need, but when we look to the shepherd, we find that he has everything we truly need. The desert has not changed, but our focus and perspective help us see all that we truly have, the riches in Christ. James 1, 17 says, Every good uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. He's not saying every good gift, good gift comes from your circumstances. He's not saying every perfect gift comes from the people who are in your life. People will go up and down. Circumstances will go up and down. The one who stays the same is God. He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that we can trust. In him we can be assured. And it says in the next part of the verse, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That means that he never changes. So it is God himself who provides all good things for you. Charles Stanley says, waiting signifies an expectant endurance that's demonstrated by a directed, purposeful active, and courageous attitude of prayer. It seems like a mouthful. <laughs> what he's saying is that when waiting, it, it involves that expected endurance 
That means that praying through your season means that it's, it's, it's not something that's easy. Refocusing your, fo- yourself on that dot in the middle of the circle is not an easy task. That means that we have to take off our look on what is causing us pain, where we're looking for relief, and to set it on Christ. Mm-hmm. And waiting means that I don't make a move without God's direction. His moving rather than our own. That means rather than focusing on that one little square that we've been waiting for, we will focus on the Father who has the best plans for our lives. What helps us to refocus often is reminding ourselves, God has plans to prosper me, not to harm me. God has, he has plans for life more abundantly for me. That means that I have to let go of that. And we look at that scripture in Jeremiah 29, 11. When you think of the context of what that scripture context means, everything when we're reading the word of God and that the context for that Bible verse is God warning them that he is sending them for one of the greatest seasons of waiting in their lives. He's sending them for 70 years in the land of Babylon under captivity, a season that will be very difficult, a season where they will be taken out of their comfort zones, out of their own land, out of everything that they know well into a land of people whose language they don't know. But you know what? In that season of waiting, that 70 years of captivity, what happened is that they discovered God as a nation, and they opened up synagogues, and God became more central to their lives. The focus was brought back to God in that season. And this is why he says, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. You might think that this season is not good for you, but I know that it is. It is exactly what you need. And God wants to give you not what you want because sometimes what we want is actually so far from what we need and what will actually bring true satisfaction to our hearts and will will actually cause us much hurt and misery. And so often in that season of waiting, our hearts need to be realigned, refocused, and redirected. Like an athlete that feels the burning sensation in his muscles, and he has to push his body forward, reminding himself of what is set before him, what the goal is. What helps him endure is really what his outcome will be. When we know that our outcome is good in Christ, when we know that if I refocus my focus, I know that this is painful, but God, help me to see things in your perspective, God. Help me to see the situation under your light. Help me to see you in this situation and not just my situation, God. Then, because I know that God, once I see you, I find peace. I know that when I see you, I find my joy back and I truly find my purpose for living again. That's what helps us, the goal behind all of this. And so when we feel the strain and pull of the discomfort in our waiting, we need to remind ourselves of who goes before us. Isaiah 41 verses 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Ultimately, no matter what you're waiting for, you are better prepared for the waiting if you're centered on God. That means that the desert doesn't change around you, but now you are better, uh, you're more at peace in that waiting, that season of waiting. Then also what happens is that when we become focused again on God, our peace is restored. What happens is that others around us benefit from it as well because our hearts now are available to others and they're available to the leading of the Holy Spirit and God wants to speak his love to the people who are around you but as long as we're focused on that one area of what of what we want then we forget about everyone else so we need to remember also that we sin when we try to meet our needs in our way rather than God's way. That one little square that you want, you absolutely want this, either an answer for that, and you're finding for you know life itself to attain that one goal. When we try to do it our way, that's sin. 
Isaiah actually, Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us are like sheep. We have wandered away from God. All of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has placed on his servants the sins of all of us. What is that sin? Us doing life our own way instead of God's way. And that's the epitome of sin, doing it things our own way. And it leads to destruction. But when we set our sights on God, you realize the incredible strength and wisdom and power that are on your side. And you know what? When we have that focus, it gives us confidence because the Lord knows and provides what's absolutely best for you. That's what your heart needs to be convinced in that season, is that God has his best for you. Sometimes that's what keeps us from letting go of what we hold on so tightly. And God's saying, I want you to surrender that very thing that you're holding on, that you're trying to figure out, that you're trying to resolve. I want you to put that into my hands. And it's hard to let go, but it's easier to let go when you remind your heart, God has plans to prosper me, not to harm me. That he has plans for an abundant life for me and not to suck me dry. And so the question is, why do you think God allows seasons of waiting in your life? Well, let me tell you, it provides an opportunity to discover who he is and how important it is to build relationship with him. Our instincts as human beings we, we don't have the natural instinct of developing healthy relationships because we're self-focused at best. And that's why it's so important to develop healthy relationship with the Father first because He teaches us all things. And then we start having healthy relationships with others. But you know, there are idols in our lives at times that impede on our faith. You know, as we direct our focus to the Father and wait patiently for His will to open wide the way for our lives, we may discover that there are many things standing in the way of deepening our relationship with God and exercising our faith in Him. In the waiting, this is where God can expose the idols of our hearts, the things that we that lay hold of our emotions, because idols will lay hold of your emotions, let me tell you. They will become they will become the, the starting point from where you make decisions because they will influence your emotions and they become more important than God. And so it is those little gray diamond shapes in the circle of your life that become more important than God. And these can be the things that we run to in order to relieve pain or stress or they can be the pursuit of our heart that in the end will leave us empty. They come to compete with our devotion with God. And, and we are too often completely blind, actually, to these issues. And sometimes we just we don't know that they're there until God points it out. And sometimes those seasons of waiting, they're there to expose those idols that have been causing us a lot of havoc in our lives. And so God allows the waiting to cause that necessary pressure for us to come to, to terms and to realize these, these things are harmful for us. But you know what? If we ask the Father to show, to, you say you pray that prayer, God, show me my idols. Oof, let me tell you, he's quick at answering that prayer. <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's not hearing, you know, what the idols are that's difficult. It's, it's responding to God immediately whenever he's showing us our idols. That's what's difficult. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult because we think we're going to lose out if we let go of those idols, if we surrender you know, our health into his hands, surrender our children into his hands, surrender our dreams, our desires, our wants into his hands. We think that we're going to lose out. But you know, John 10, 9 to 11 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go uh, in and out and find pasture. He says, the thief does not come except to steal and, and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. What you're letting go into God's hands is not because God wants it to ruin your fun or make your life miserable. It's because he wants you to have life and more abundantly. 
He says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. So idols will steal. Idols will kill the very joy that you have in your heart. They will take your focus, promising to bring you peace, promising to bring you joy, but will leave you empty. That's what the enemy does. He's a liar. And so it, it destroys us in the long run. And I just want to name a few of those idols, you know, just common things that can be one of those little squares in your life that, atten- that take up the attention. One of those idols, and this was one of the idols that took so long for God to break in my life, unfortunately. You can't see the little number one, but anyway, that's number one. <laughs> Our own understanding. Our own understanding can be an idol. You think you know better. Or you think you know God. Or you think you know what God's plan is for your life. Or you think you know what is best for your life. That is something that is so hard to let go. And let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, that once I let go of this and I started submitting myself and surrendering myself under God's understanding instead of my own, I don't try to figure things out anymore. I just release the situations and the circumstances and everything that I'm thinking and feeling about what I'm going through. When as I release, his peace comes over and resolve does come. He comes with an answer. He's a faithful God. He's not going to leave me hanging and dry. But he does want me to release it to him. And so we lose focus uh, on the Father when we go over these situations in our head and try to figure them out. God commands us to trust in him and not rely on our own understanding. We've heard that Bible verse, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Sometimes we want God to give us an answer, but we have not let go of our own understanding. And we're like, God, why are you not answering? Well, I'm just waiting (laughs) for you to want to hear what I have to say. Secondly, a second idol can be our own sense of security. You know, we don't like we don't like to feel like things are out of control. And we also want to be in control of our own future. That can become a very uh, all-encompassing focus of our lives. And we're in a waiting situation our, and our future seems to be threatened. That's even, especially if you if you're fearing something that is coming to you. When you fear that something bad is on its way or that something in the future could go wrong, then our insecurities can actually cause us to distrust God. And that's why we need to remind our hearts of God's faithfulness and his goodness. Third, thirdly, uh, one of the idols can be your goals and your dreams. And there's nothing wrong with goals and dreams when they are surrendered to Christ, when they're under his will. Our decision-making can be greatly influ- influenced by our desires to see our dreams and goals come true. We will, uh, we will even at times not even consider God in the picture. And sometimes we make plans for our future. We have goals, but we haven't even considered saying, God, you know, what do you think of this plan? What do you think of this goal? Do you think that this is good for me? Or even bringing, God, this, this is the desire of my heart. This is what I would like to see happen. But God, I surrender those things unto your hands. And Lord, I, I trust you with the outcome and the direction about this very goal and this very dream. Sometimes we've, we're afraid that if we bring this before God, he's going to say, no, you can't have that. And so we don't bring it before God. We go our own way. And so this causes us to forfeit, actually, even the greatest blessings of God. When we chose to hold on to something we think is best for us, we actually forfeit what God has for us, which could be something so much better. And next, uh, fourthly, relationships can be an idol. You know, our need for acceptance from certain people often supersedes our understanding of God's love even. We're so wanting to, you know, that need for acceptance and significance is so strong with us that we just like, if only this person, you know, would be my friend, or if only these people would visit me more often, if only these people would call me or say hello or hug me or do this or do that. And God's saying, I will not serve your idols because people are fickle. People will change. No one is perfect. The only one who is perfect is God. He will, is the only one who will always love you no matter where you're at in life. 
His love is constant. But often our idols were saying, God, I want I want to feel loved this way. And God's saying, no, this love is so menial compared to my love. I want you to receive my love. But sometimes we don't want God's love. We don't want it because we think that it is not enough. And when he becomes the focus again, then we get to experience love, life on a, on a such greater love, a level and his love on a greater level as well. And you know what happens, you know, and when these relationships fail you, and they will, we become bitter, guess, towards who? God. You know, God, why is this person treating me? I don't deserve to be treated this way. Or, you know, why am I always alone? And then, and then, and then we keep going. And, but God never intended that way. He wants to be the focus of your life because he wants to fill your heart. Fifthly, the past can become an idol. You know, when things have happened in the past, we can let the unkind treatment of others shape our view of the Heavenly Father. When we refuse to let go of bitterness towards people, or when we choose not to forgive, that becomes an idol, and it actually turn, hardens our heart towards receiving God's love. And we start perceiving God falsely because of holding on to things of the past. And lastly, hobbies can become an idol. And there's nothing wrong with hobbies in itself. It's, it's, it's when it becomes a way of coping with life instead of God. You know, I've, I've come to understand that, you know, for me it was watching TV and episodes during the pandemic. I watched too many of them. <laughs> but they were just a signal flag of, say, of God saying, you know, when your focus becomes only on that, it means there's something that's that's disturbing you within your heart that needs to resolve, I want to be the one to resolve that. Watching one more episode is not going to change how I feel. Actually, it kind of does the opposite because your anxiety just keeps growing and growing and growing when you don't resolve things. But God wants to be the one to resolve uh, the issues of your heart. And he wants to be your all. He doesn't want you to just cope with life. Remember what Jesus said. He said, I've come to give them life more abundantly. He didn't just say, I've come to bring them, you know, life so they can come to heaven, just survive earth. No. God wants to give you life here on earth more abundantly in heaven as well. And that take that means that we invite him in on all of the situations. Our focus becomes him. And Charles Stanley says lastly, I like I've, I've quoted him a lot, but he, he had really a lot of good quotes. He says, Whatever you release to the Lord, you get more and better in return. That's the key thing that you need to understand. I'll repeat that again because it is so key that we understand. Whatever you release to the Lord, you get more and better in return. You know, Pastor Mona last week talked about uh, how in our that waiting season, we can have a never mindset. And when our eyes are fixated on these idols, we will have the never mindset. And so you will have never mindsets like, I will never get out of this. I will never feel safe. I will never be able to trust people. I will never be happy. I will never uh, feel like I fit in. There are so many other nevers. My situation will never change. Well, I want to tell you today that as we fix our eyes on Jesus, and gain better perspective, we get to see God's I wills instead of our nevers. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about it. There's so many scriptures that says, I will. If you go to the next slide, one of the, th the things that he says, he says, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. I will keep you. I will give you rest. And then the next one, I've got a few more for you. He says, I will love you. I will come again one day and I will send the Holy Spirit and I will make you fishers of men. Meaning that he wants to give you a greater place of influence in that season of waiting. Don't wait for the season of waiting to be finished so that you have a testimony of what God has done. No, God wants to give you a testimony in that season of waiting because people are watching. They're watching your life. 
And it's not to feel like, you know, we're being observed all day long, but we can bring hope to a hopeless generation. We can bring joy in people seeing us struggle, but find peace. And them saying, you know what? There's something about this person that I don't have. And that is who we have. We have Christ. And when he becomes the focus, then things are put into proper perspective and we get to see how God is moving and shaking things in your life. You know, I love that that one of the songs, you know, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're moving. He's doing, you know, you never stop. You never stop working. God never stops working on your behalf. Even though if you feel in that time and place of your this season of your life that God isn't moving, sometimes you just need to have your focus realigned. And so I want to encourage you today, refocus your gaze on Christ in your season of waiting, in the difficulties that you're going through. And so I just want us to take a moment just to reflect and ask God, God, what are these idols in my life that have caused me to lose sight of you and have caused me to lose sight of the peace, the joy, the strength that is found only in you? And we'll just take a few, a minute or two, just to take that time for reflection before we finish off today. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that you are our cornerstone, that we can find our strength in you alone and that we can find all that we need that you are the secret to us finding contentment in in the lacking and in the fullness and that we can find our peace uh, in you alone Lord Jesus and I pray for uh, our people today and those listening online that they would find peace in you they would oh God you would give them the strength and the courage oh God to let go of those small uh, aspects of their lives and they would get to see you and get to know you in a greater measure than ever before and I pray oh God just your blessing over your people but your sustaining power in this great season of waiting that we have been going through in this pandemic because you are Lord over it all Lord we thank you and praise you